Hello and welcome to this episode of the Place Northwest podcast, brought to you in collaboration with Winkworth Sherwood. Winkworth Sherwood is a law firm working across a broad range of sectors. One of those is housing. The company counts many of the UK's largest house builders and developers among its clients and prides itself on having an intimate understanding of the industry. Today, we will talk more about the issues the housing sector is grappling with, discuss what Wentworth Sherwood is hearing from clients about the challenges they are facing, and explore how to unlock supply in order to address the housing crisis. I'm your host, Dan Whelan, and today I am joined by Lindsay Garrett, partner at Wentworth Sherwood, Colette McCormack, head of planning and partner at Wentworth Sherwood, and Jackie Sadek, director at Urban Strategy. Great to have you all here during CIH as well, so a very timely uh, moment to be having this discussion. Colette, I'll come to you first. Can you give us a, a bit of an introduction into Wentworth Sherwood and the work that you do, please? Well, Wentworth Sherwood, um, in terms of housing, um, is, I suppose, the reason why we're so well known in the housing sector is because we feel we have a 360 view on the pressures and commercial pressures um, on um, housing, basically, as you say, because we act for a number of the um, G15 um, R- um, RPs, and we act for local planning authorities, and we act for developers. So we understand the whole pressure in terms of um, uh, whether it's planning, whether it's um, governance issues, um, whether it's pot sales, whether it's managing tenants. We do the whole cradle to grave of um, housing delivery. Um, and because of that, I think um, it, it gives us that deep understanding in um, in housing. Absolutely. Yeah, that 360 view that you mentioned. And you gathered some big hitters earlier today to talk about some of the issues uh, facing the housing uh, industry. Um, Jackie, tell us a little bit about, about that, just to set the scene. Well, just to say the guys that went with Sher- Sherwood just to be con- congratulated on, on pulling together a really senior group of professionals into the room this morning. Very big hitters, very big thinking going on. And quite a lot of uh, grievances being aired in a very candid and robust sort of way. But also, I might say, a lot of positivity and a lot of good ideas as to what we could do working together to actually pull things around. Now, this is a very difficult market we're working in, you know, I mean, possibly the most difficult operational market that I've ever known. And what Lindsay described the other day rather rather brilliantly as a perfect storm. We are facing a huge plethora of issues. And um, I have to say, the guys were very forthcoming this morning about finding answers to those those challenges. And I was greatly encouraged, actually. Excellent. Well, that's good to hear. And we will drill down a little bit deeper to talk about some of the things that they, that they said. Um, Lindsay, let, let's get into this then, the housing crisis. We all accept we're, we're in one. You know, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, was speaking to Jackie earlier about the, the last time we hit that 300,000 uh, units a year target was a long, long time ago before I was born. So give us a, a bit of a, a bit of an insight into the housing crisis. What are the main challenges facing developers and, and house builders currently? Well, I, I mean, I think first off, we have to just uh, recognise that the, the operating environment and the, um, the economic climate is really challenging. Um, and we've got interest rates at 5%. We've got mortgage rates that are going up. We've got, you know, um, rents that are going up, bill costs, materials, cost of finance. It's a really challenging economic time for for developers and RPs in the market um, set against um, reducing supply um, and an all-time low of of planning permissions for for housing generally. I think from from our perspective as, as planning lawyers, um, working in the sector, we're seeing um, an increasing plethora of new legislation and new levies and and new um, policies coming through, which are just layering the system for for, for developers and becoming increasingly um, burdensome for them. So we've got you know post Grenfell building safety levy. Um, we've got the residential property development tax, which came in last year. We've got the prospect of a new infrastructure levy. We've got um, BNG coming in in November this year, um, carbon zero commitments and uh, issues with that. So this this just an, an enormous amount of of change and an additional policy and legislation, which um, is 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 a cost, an additional cost to developers. Where you know, that's on top as well, isn't it, of um, borrowing costs going up, 
electricity going up, um, build costs going up. We all know where inflation is. So it's, it's, it's actually, as you say, a really difficult market to operate in, especially um, in terms of trying to deliver big schemes with big housing numbers because they, by definition, um, take a long time to prepare and usually have a long build out. And therefore, um, you know, the uncertainty that's around at the moment, if you talk to most RPs or most developers as to kind of how their costs have increased in the last 12 months, it's exponential. It's in a million. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, one of the things that we've been hearing from the construction sector, for example, and, and from developers is that it's very hard to lock in a price. That's right. When the rates are up and down all the time and, and that's delaying starts on site and we're already really seeing that, you know. Um, it, it is a concern, Jackie. Do you envisage change in in the in the you know the near future? Are those rates going to come down? Are things going to get easier in that regard? Well, you'd hope so, but I'm I'm not optimistic on that front at all. I have to say, and and I think the the thing the industry is crying out for, and certainly this came through loud and clear this morning, the the entire hour, was how much we need certainty and certainty in the market. And also, you know, we need to diversify the, the supplier base. We we don't have anything like enough uh, suppliers of, of various whatever skills, and we don't have anything like enough skills training. That came through loud and clear, didn't it? I mean, it was extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. The, the certainty thing is really important, um, in particular in terms of um, delivery, um, funding, um, because... You know, we the the one thing the one thing kind of the industry needs is that certainty, isn't it? Because you can't you can't forward plan the way that you need to forward plan to deliver the amount of housing that we need in this country without having some certainty around what those parameters are and and how you can move forward. One of the encouraging things that came up this morning, and I I was greatly taken with this, was whilst we're desperate for government to give us certainty through the regulatory framework, what we're not so desperate for is government money to prop up stuff. Quite a lot of very good ideas about how to further leverage institutional funding. We still know, we know there's still a wall of capital out there that's trying to get into the sector. We're desperate to get that 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 capital in and working for us. How do you do that? Mm. Quite a lot of discussion about how we get into a partnership with an institutional investor in, in a meaningful way, which means, you know, it's not just all gloss and press release it's actually it actually leads to some actual delivery and a lot of good ideas buzzing around that so uh, quite a lot of wish to get government to be a bit more supportive of us in a regulatory way but not so much need for grant and i wonder on that point about un about certainty and uncertainty um you know it, it didn't help when the government kind of took a backward step and said that the three hundred thousand a year target was was now advisory that's had a knock-on impact on on housing delivery, hasn't it, Lindsay? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, again, um, that's that's thrown up huge challenges because the the effect of that is is that for for those local authorities that perhaps um, didn't want to deliver those kinds of numbers, it's given them an excuse to either withdraw or pause their local plans. Um, and so, you know, for big strategic allocations or where developers are looking at those kinds of sites, that, that all that that's done is created massive uncertainty um, as to whether or not those sites will actually come forward at all. Um, so, you know, that that kind of step um, is really unhelpful. And it, it, it it's, you know, we, we, we've seen that in terms of the industry response. There's been a huge backlash against the infrastructure levy let's be fair there's there's um, enormous criticism of it there's so much opposition um the bpf hbf um the local government association the law society you know they've all come out saying we, we just don't need another complex regime um to deliver infrastructure we have a system we have a sill section 106 system it's not perfect but improvements can be made to that um and it's a known system it's a system that is at least working now is not the time to be bringing in an entirely new system that that is going to take another ten years to work through. Better the devil you know in the, in this instance, I think. Well, and well, and worse still, the devil you know wouldn't go away. So you wouldn't end up replacing Section One Hundred Six with the infrastructure levy. You'd end up with Section One Hundred Six and SIL 
and the infrastructure level. Mm. Uh, you know, you'd end up with with the whole three, planet. three doubles. Yeah, well, you'd, you'd end up. And you just keep layering on confusion after confusion. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the ladies are right. I mean, they're on the chalk face of this. You know, it, it didn't need much encouragement for NIMBY local authorities to pull their local plans. And when Theresa Villiers, you know, pulled the managed to get the government to pull the national housing target, it was a gift for local authorities who didn't want to do anything. And these guys are trying to deal with this day in, day out. They're poor mm. clients. I mean, you know, you do despair, really. And I have to say, I don't think it's going to uh, retain Theresa Villiers' seat for her. I, 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 the word from Whitehall is, is you know, it's, it might be popular in her constituency, but she's she's not going to win the seat. So, yeah. you know, what was all that about? Yeah, the, yeah, the planning the planning system and, and the constant tinkering, as you say, that comes in for a lot of criticism in the industry, doesn't it? And And... For whatever reason, it, it, people won't leave it alone. But, but there is um, a, an undeniable fact that it's it's severely under-resourced, isn't it? So do we have any ideas about how we can deal with that problem? Because, frankly, we need more bodies in there dealing with planning applications. We do. We absolutely do. And a really interesting point that came out, and that came out of the roundtable this morning from um, from all, all, all sides, and also I think our clients say this all the time, um, it's not about um, it, it's not about kind of the cost of it in terms of payment. Most of them said I'd quite happily double or triple my application fee. Well, one one person said six times I'll pay six times the application wow. fee for certainty in the system. Yeah. That's how powerful this was. Wow. But but you're absolutely right, Dan. I mean, what we absolutely absolutely need is um, at the moment we need to encourage more young people to come into the sector. To, come to you know to be planning officers um one of the um points was stop calling them development and control or development management because if you're a young person coming into the industry do you want to go into planning development control or development management actually something really as simple as calling them development enablers hmm. so that they felt that they were coming in and adding something to the system but ultimately that's going to, that's a, a long-term issue um you know but we definitely, I think, again, and I think it's acknowledged across the industry, I think, you know, local government and local planning authorities are severely under-resourced and they need more money. Mm. Um, the the long-term training um, will take some time, but if they had money, they could buy some of that skill set in. And the other thing is, um, we, you know, we, we've lost the um, kind of gravitas as, or stature of, the chief planner, you know, when I first came into the industry, you know, the head of planning, the chief planner had vision. Um, it was an important job and they had strategy. Again, certainty. You knew what that chief planner's vision was for their city, which then obviously sat within the chief execs, remit and members. Um, but we very, you know, the, the role of chief head of planning has gone now. We've got um, very few of them. Let's, let's imagine... There is no money. There is no money. More money for the planning system, or more likely, you know, under a new government, there is money, but not enough. What can local authorities and, and their planning systems do with what they've got currently to make the system better? Is there anything they could do, or are they doing the best they can currently? Do you think? Hard question. I, I think it depends. I think it depends on the local authority, to be honest. Yeah, um, because some local authorities um, are very good. Um, and will focus on um, a lot of upfront work. So ideally, um, certainly on a lot of the big um, schemes that we work on, um, you know, you do you front load an awful lot. Um, and so the idea is that when it gets into the planning system, it moves through quickly. There are some local planning authorities who will allocate certain officers um, to strategic sites to make sure that they deliver those. So I think it very much depends on on the actual um, the actual borough itself. Um, you know, I think PPAs have a role to play in that um, and finding other ways of planning performance. Plan, sorry, planning performance agreements. Finding other ways of um, of levering in funding that's not necessarily government funding. Mm. Um, and again, you know, going back to what we were saying about de developers and RPs being prepared to pay for application fees. Um, equally, they're prepared to pay for PPA fees if they know um, that an application will follow a particular trajectory and it will hit the milestones that have been agreed at pre-app. 
And also, I think it's um, engagement with, with you know, kind of the wider industry. You know, I mean, Lindsay, you've mentioned the RTPI. I mean, Sue Bridge, the president at the moment, is really keen on getting more people into um, uh, local authorities. And, you know, there would be ways that they could, as I say, buy that skill in. And if they haven't got the cash, then maybe it could be done on some other type of scheme where, because actually for a young planner, maybe going on secondment to a local planning authority, it's fantastic experience. Um, and in fact, the best planners we know usually started in local authority, you know, earn their stripes and then moved into private practice. So there, I'm, I'm sure there are situations where you could do secondments or and certainly around apprenticeships, if, if the actual physical money isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, Lindsay, about the, and it's related to the planning system, about the obligations that developers are under to, to adhere to certain levies and, you know, jump through certain hoops. Um, and you said that it's it's sort of, it's quite onerous and it, and it slows down the process and they're perhaps overburdened. Give, give us a couple of examples of that and maybe talk about as well if that's not the way to do it you know to make sure that biodiversity net gain is is uh is prioritized and and all the other things what is the correct system well i mean i think we we were seeing we're seeing a, a number of new levies and i don't think anybody would dispute the principle behind these levies so for example the building safety levy which is proposed um is there um to try and raise um about three billion um, so that leaseholders affected by cladding issues don't have to pay for pay for those works. Um, so I don't think there's the, the principles in dispute, but um, it's it's the it's the way in which these things are being brought in um, without any detail, without any knowledge of the transitional arrangements. So that it, uncertainty that it's creating is that if you are looking at buying a big site, you just don't know what your liability is going to be in relation to that site. Right. Um, in relation to that particular levy, because you've, it, it, it's it's really difficult to factor that into your appraisal or price it into 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 buying site. Mm. Um, so, you know, I don't I, I don't I don't think we're we're challenging the principle of these things with the infrastructure level. We just don't need another complex new system. Mm -hmm. And the planning system, when working properly, proactively, actually. You know, it, it's more than just housing. It's about it's about creating a place and a sense of place and space. And if that works properly, then the affordable housing is part of that because it's a mixed community. You know, the um, climate change issues issues are part of that because um, you know we all want to be sustainable. Um, you know, sites need to you know kind of have um, you know support the green agenda. This is all the the planning system is set up to to already do all those things. Even in terms of you know design, um, you know there's national design codes. Most local planning authorities have design codes. There's a plethora of policy legislation and local plans that actually can can deliver all, all this mm. um, and and a good a good sense of place. And that was one of the things that you know was coming out today as well, in particular from Homes England because. They don't want to just see housing delivery. They want to see places being delivered because, you know, that's you. You nobody wants to live in a, a block of flats in the middle of nowhere. Everybody yeah. wants to live in a you know in a in a nice place. Um, and I firmly believe that the the framework of the planning system as it is can deliver that if used proactively. In you know certainly in the context of you know like planning conditions and obligations and stuff like that mm -hmm. done properly. You know, when when you see it work well, it's brilliant. You know. Yeah, yeah, but it can it can work. It can work. That's the point. Yeah, it can work. But you you you've got to have that. You've got to have that political will, on on behalf of government and local planning authorities, yeah. and you've got to have, um, you know, developers and RPs that also want to deliver on that agenda. And that's why I know I keep coming back to it. That's why we need certainty. That's why we need housing targets. Um, that's why we need, um, you know, to, to, to be able to deliver because then that feeds into funders and, you know, funders get nervous when there's yeah. uncertainty. Yeah, when but... there's no money, there's no delivery. Yeah, certainty breeds confidence and then we go from there. You mentioned Homes England there. I want to talk to, about them very briefly, Jackie. 
um, they've been outspoken about their sh the shift that Colette was alluding to there about from purely just delivering numbers to the more regenerative approach. Is that is that a good move in terms of unlocking supply? Uh, those of us in the regeneration sector were shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, about time, frankly. The old model was uh, money out, num numbers in, housing in, your numbers of housing in. And, you, and, and this awful thing that used to happen with Home England with used to talk about units and you know we'd all be saying oh, look excuse me this is where people live can mm. you talk about homes please not units uh it was pretty dehumanizing um but that was the old model the old model was housing targets um money out numbers in and that was how how the whole thing was set up i have to say um hats off really to peter freeman who is the chair the chair of homes england because he has a regeneration background himself and he came in with a very firm clear ethos that you create places where people want to live and work and come and dwell and that that is the secret to a good place. And it goes back to Colette's point about when the planning system works well, it can deliver all of those things. So a massive thrust from Homes England. We certainly, we heard it this morning on the whole issue of regeneration and placemaking being central to the delivery of homes. You can't have the one without the other, really. And actually, that's a great thing that, that Homes England have woken up to in no uncertain fashion. There is no way that you will deliver the homes that people want to live in unless you deliver the places that people want to live in. And that's, you know... And then that feeds into having an established industrial strategy as well. It, it does. And let's get on to that. Although just before we leave, leave just I just wanted to say, Dan, I didn't think any of that was rocket science, but it's taken quite a long awakening to get to that point. So, you know... Uh, what is the what is the expression? Hell ha or heaven has more more pleasure in a sinner that's repented than you know whatever that expression is. Uh, I I have to say it's fantastic that Homes England are banging that drum. But go on to the the uh, the industrial strategy point, collects. That's very important. Well, I think again, I think it feeds into certainty. If you have a clear industrial strategy, um, you know, around kind of um, not just around housing but around jobs and around the socioeconomics of it, then everybody knows what they're working towards. The planning system can support that. Um, and, and again, it's that certainty that allows um, money to, to come in um, because it's, um, you know, funders are interested in not just, as you say, it's not just about building homes. It's also about, you know, creating, you know, you know creating the climate for um, communities to, to exist and thrive. Um, and, you know, in all my years as a planning lawyer, I've never known housing delivery so far up the political agenda on every agenda. Right. You know, even in even in um, local, I mean, it's always been kind of, um, people have always been interested in kind of, you know, where's, where's the local housing near me? But actually talking about housing numbers and targets and delivery. Um, it, no, it's national newspaper stuff now, isn't it? I mean, it's, you always pick up the paper and... Which is a positive, right? Well, I think I think it is a positive because it's you know it, it it it's it's a national debate and it's and you know it's now it's entered the mainstream and everybody's talking about it. Um, I want to cast the mind forward now, if we if we can. So there's been some good news recently, hasn't there? In in in, in this space, you know, yesterday at, at CIH, uh, so the first day of CIH uh, in Manchester, Andy Burnham waged war on bad landlords, said he was gonna clean up um, bad housing stock across Greater Manchester. Everyone would have a, a safe home to live in by 2038, he said. Um, Labour is is still banging the drum for Greenbelt release to deliver more homes. Homes England, as we mentioned, take a regenerative approach, scrapping the net additionality rule, among other things. These are positive steps towards delivery, aren't they? Okay. So I want to talk about now your idea of housing utopia. Cast the mind forward. Where will we be in five, ten years? And what's the key to get there? We'll start with you, Colette. My plea to uh, government would be what well, the next government that we get after the next general election, whoever it is, is um, don't reform the planning system. You know, ask the industry how it works. Look at best examples, because I honestly believe if you go around the country and look at where the planning system works, there are examples of best practice and we can learn from that without, you know, ripping up the rule book and, and, and throwing it out. So certainly um, that would be a, a, a big a big call um, for me. If we are talking utopia, 
Um, then I suppose one of the things that came out of today's debate and one of the things that I think all three of us firmly believe is, um, you know, goes back to we all, every political party acknowledges we need more housing. Um, housing is, you know, and placemaking is integral to, you know, kind of life expectancy, your job, your, you know, career, health. We need more housing. If it's a real utopia, then we would say, take the politics out of it, you know, have some type of cross-party accord on how we see housing to be delivered in the next, and I would say 30 to 50 years, that'd be the vision I'd be looking at, you know, because that gives the certainty for everybody to work towards. Lindsay, what's your view? Um, I think, um, obviously, completely wholeheartedly support all of, all of what Colette says. Um, I think you know there are, there are a few other things as well that we could we could do. Um, there needs to be greater support and a package of support for new entrants into the market. Um, the SMEs been talked about a lot. Um, Homes England are um, rightly supportive of diversification and bringing new entrants into the market. Um, but it's tough, you know, all, all the challenges we've just talked about for the last um, twenty minutes or so. Um, they are they are barriers to SMEs. So, you know, then there needs to be um, more support um, for, for SMEs, absolutely. Um, and then I think, you know, there are there are other things that we could do. Um, we could be more joined up in relation to um, statutory consultees and utility companies and the way in which they're engaged in the process a lot earlier in the process so that there aren't barriers at the last minute to delivery of, of big sites because, uh, you know, issues have been left too late. I think you know these these are these are easy wins right they're, they're, they're things that we could do and, and improve on um which would help to unlock delivery yeah it's like jackie said before a lot of this isn't rocket science you know it's just it's just identifying the the issue and, and doing something about it jackie what, what's your view on on what housing will look like in five ten years time well naturally i agree with my learned friends but i have to say i think one of the things we've got to do is recognize that the housing crisis is mainly one of affordability and that the entire thrust of government, of government policy should be in the affordable space. I'd like to see a return to the New Towns Act after the war. We, we did a fantastic job creating a whole number of new towns right across the UK. I'd like to see a lot more new settlements, big, big schemes coming forward. And that would, in, in, that would entail a better release of public land. And I don't just mean local authority land. I also mean government land, NHS estates defence land, all of that. I'd like to see all of that brought forward. And that would also entail, would, would be predicated upon a better resourced planning system. But if you've got the applicants who are willing to pay for that, that doesn't have to come out of the public purse. And if you're doing big enough settlements and with enough certainty, then I think there is potentially a solution there. So I, I, I don't think it's beyond us to come up with a series of measures I'm greatly encouraged by the fact that housing's gone up the agenda, the political agenda, but it hasn't been for decades. We've had something like 20 different uh, house, housing ministers over the last 20 years. That, that The body language of both the shades of government hasn't looked as if housing has been a priority. It has to now become a priority in much the same way as it was after the First World War when the three pillars of public service were health, education and housing key to that was housing fantastic thank you so much for taking the time it's been fascinating we've been a whistle stop tour through the issues facing the industry and the potential solutions and um, that's all we've got time for on today's episode to learn more about wingless sherwood uh, you can visit wslaw.co.uk and for the latest property news and insights head to placenorthwest.co.uk thank you very much for listening see you soon